Oh, you didn't just do that for us all too long ago. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think we're in. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So by the clock on the wall, I call this uh, session of city capital regular meeting on October 24th, roll call and pledge allegiance. Council Member Story. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Bator. Here. And Member John. Here. So I'd like to call upon Mark Stone to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. It is my honor if everyone would rise, salute, and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So with that, we have a presentation by the same assembly member, Mark Stone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. I'm happy to be here and report a little bit on the state of the state and take your questions to the extent that I can answer them. I am happy to do so. So this last year was pretty interesting. We had a new administration come in even though the legislature now has been fairly stable as far as membership goes over the last number of years and has learned its business under the tutelage of Governor Brown. <laughs> when Newsom's administration has come in, some, a lot of, lots the same and some differences. Overall, the health of the state is pretty strong fiscally. We have now set up because of the rainy day fund and this notion of trying to make sure that we are where we have excess revenues, we're collecting them, we're not spending them, but ideally putting them into reserves to minimize the impact of the next downturn. And that's been a pretty constant theme. It was something that Governor Brown was very interested in and the legislature truly adopted it and embraced it. So at this point, the state of California has more in reserve than I think it's 38 states have in their general funds. Wow. So we're, of course, we're a very large state and have a lot of impacts, but the what hopefully that means is as we go into the next downturn, because cities and counties are so reliant on the state, given the revenue structure and the tax structure, that there will be less pain that the state will be causing, that is my hope, I know that is your hope, to local jurisdictions as we go through those next steps. So the notion of the rainy day fund and the reserves is to stop sort of the the deep troughs and to clip off a little bit at the, of the high end, take those revenues and, and store them away. It also lets the state pay down some of the long-term obligations even before they come due and help future governors and future legislatures sort of manage some of the pension issues and some of the other things in a, in a much more rational way. So we're paying down some of the debt, paying down some of the, the long-term obligations. And California's debt picture is actually very strong. Every jurisdiction wants to carry some debt, including the state of California, in order to have a strong bond rating. And California now has a very strong bond rating. The sort of mythical wall of debt just doesn't really exist. We do have some debt in terms of some of the bonds that have been put into place. The big concern are the long-term obligations and the ability of the state in out years to meet those obligations. That's, that's ultimately the challenge, which is why as we have money, we've been using that to pay down some of those long-term obligations and make the state's general fund that, that much stronger, especially if we head into an economic downturn, which is always being predicted. I think Jerry Brown always said, oh, this year is gonna be the year, so we can't spend any money. That was how we started the budget process. This year, Governor Newsom is looking a little bit more cautiously at this point at next year's budget, so we'll have to see what that means with what he puts together. But that's not to say the state hasn't been investing. We've been setting aside quite a bit of money for a number of different initiatives, and a lot of these are things that Governor Newsom is interested in. For example, children and young families. For the first time, we're, the legislature, and especially the assembly, has been very interested in early childhood education very interested in child care and expanding our education opportunities to the youngest. And education opportunities for the youngest also means support for those families to get the, those kids and those families ready for school and break some of the cycles of poverty and violence and, and abuse. And we know that if we invest in those families that incidences of child abuse and spousal abuse go down over time. That's definitely the, the goal that we're playing towards. And so Governor Newsom is, is 
very willing to do that. In fact, he put a, uh, we now have a Surgeon General, Nadine Burke Harris in the state of California and her expertise is as a pediatrician and with respect to adverse childhood experiences. The more we understand ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and use that to inform us on decisions, whether it's education or support for families, the better off those families are and the stronger our communities are. So that's a big shift away from that the Brown administration had not been interested in, this administration definitely is. And the legislature has been very interested in those kinds of, of investments as well. There's also been, as you've probably seen, a real push on housing. California is short about three and a half million units across the state. And there's a lot of impetus to push local jurisdictions to do more and more and more. And when Newsom gave his inauguration speech, and some of this was in the state of the state, his first state of the state last winter, he talked about carrots and sticks. Well, so far we've been pretty good about trying to put some of the sticks in place but not a lot of the carrots. And I have honestly pushed back on some of that because I know the struggles that you have. You are constrained from resources. RDAs were taken away from local jurisdictions. Under Prop 13, you have very limited ability to raise and manage taxes, which is why we typically, with local jurisdictions, talk about some parcel taxes or sales taxes or things that are, especially sales taxes, that are regressive and, and very difficult for a lot of people to manage. So I think it's incumbent on the state, if we want to push local jurisdictions with respect to housing policy, to put money on the table to let you do exactly that. And we've been, even though there's about two and a half billion dollars for housing and homelessness that we set aside in the budget, very little guidance on how that's ultimately going to get spent and how we get that down to local jurisdictions that are indeed struggling and struggling to meet the obligations as you struggle to meet the housing needs of, of your own community. So that's something that we will, we will continue to work on. Budget process with the new administration was interesting because they were, we were of course as a legislature trying to hold our ground and say, nope, we're in charge of the budget process. And new governor comes in and says, nope, we're in charge of the budget process. So there was a little bit of tussling, but hopefully that's been worked out as we go into this next budget year. I'm hoping that will be a little bit smoother as we move through that process. But this governor is very ambitious with some of his goals and some of the things that he wants to accomplish. And that should be good, but I, I do worry about some of the implications like that that we're putting on local jurisdictions. I know you're also very interested in PG&E and <laughs> sort of the things that are going on because they're, they're actually threatening more power shutoffs this coming weekend. That's, that's what we understand. And the legislature has pushed back a bit on PG&E and PG&E's demands. And frankly, I think they made certain business decisions over the last 10 years about what they were going to do with respect to upgrading their infrastructure. And they rolled the dice on what might be happening and it turns out they lost. So they were sending, spending more money on shareholder equity and return on those investments than upgrading their infrastructure. And one of the things that I want to point out is that San Diego Gas and Electric, for example, after the fires in San Diego 10 plus years ago, well, these are 12, 15 years ago, almost now, woke up to the risk that the fires were causing. And every time I talk about how good SDG&E is, I get comments from my colleagues from San Diego who say, yeah, not quite so much. But in this instance, they were much better. They put together a risk assessment plan and they implemented it. They've been doing some of the same kinds of public safety power shutoffs that we've been seeing now with PG&E, and they've been doing it for a number of years. Those don't hit the newspaper. Why don't those hit the newspaper? It's because they're doing them surgically. PG&E seems to want to come in with the largest hammer possible and just shut everything down. So they haven't really thought this through. They haven't, didn't come up with a good strategy for how to get to re-energize the lines and put things back on, and they have not invested in the fast switching and ground fault switching line insulation that SDG&E did, San Diego Gas and Electric, that makes the, their system stronger, safer, and more able to deal with some of the fluctuations that, that are there. So the power shutoffs are a bit dramatic, and in some ways, I'm not, we have asked a lot of questions about their justifying the, the broad scope of the power shutoffs. And they have come through after the last power shutoff. They, they are now showing some pictures and some examples of damage to some of the power lines. Well, okay, that, that happened during the storm. 
was that a good thing that then that they shut down those power lines because of the damage? Well, we've done a little bit of research and we're starting to notice that some of the, the damage that they're claiming happened in the storm actually happened before the storm. So the veracity of the data that they're showing us seems to be a bit suspect. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what's going on. So even though the legislature is out of session right now, there are a number of bills floating around that I've been talking to some of my colleagues about that will hold PG&E to higher standards. We wanted to give them tools to keep the public safe and not have the, the scope of the wildfires that we had seen before. That's laudable. But we gave them a, a strategic tool that they seem to be using almost as a weapon against everyone else. And that part is very frustrating. So we're going to have to legislate again, pull the reins in on, make them responsible, and try and find a way. And the governor's been very verbose about this as well, find a way to make sure that if they're shutting down the lines, and especially without the justification that they're claiming that there are consequences to that action. A lot remains to be seen as we go through this. We'll learn more if they shut down again. The PUC, for the first time in a long time, has been highly, highly critical. The Public Utilities Commission, the current president of PG&E and their actions, which was a bit refreshing to see, mm -hmm. as, opposed, as opposed to being an organization that just kind of backs the public utility, the investor-owned utility, they're being highly critical of some of those actions. So if the PUC will do their job, the administration will push back and the legislature will push back, then I think we have a much better chance of kind of reining in these actions. But we will have to see as that, as that moves forward. But hopefully that everything from your standpoint has been, been functioning. I know there were power outages uh, across the county. Again, we're going to continue to ask questions, push hard, pretty hard on PG&E for the justifications. And if they can't answer up to it, there, there will be consequences as we go into next year. Uh, that's a bit of the, the updates, sort of the highlights of some of the things that we've been working on. I continue to work, especially in the juvenile justice system and the child welfare system, the, the foster care system. And as I talk about both of those systems, I hope will eventually go away. We know that they won't because kids struggle, families struggle, but we overutilize some of those systems. And by changing attitudes and making the systems more humane and focusing on outcomes for children, then I think we as a state can do much better. In fact, some of the reforms that we've done in the child welfare system put California in the lead with some of the federal legislation that is coming down, being able to implement that, which means we'll have a better chance of drawing down federal funds to help those children that are most at risk in our communities. So we're working quite a bit through there. The administration fairly recently has put in place Secretary of, of Health and Human Services. We have a new Secretary of the Social Services, and pretty soon we will see a new Secretary of the Department of Healthcare Services. I'm looking forward to kind of new attitudes and ideas in those organizations as we look to for next steps with reforming those systems to benefit our, our kids and our children. On an environmental standpoint, which I know you're interested in, a bit of a mixed bag this last year. There were some significant attempts to reduce plastic in the environment that were ultimately not successful. And a bill that was hopefully going to protect California against federal rollbacks in the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act was, didn't sit with, the governor didn't sit with his favor and, and he vetoed it. But we are going to continue to work on those issues and make sure that California is able to protect our own values with respect to the environment, what we see, and, and how we want to make sure that we are protecting it. Sea level rise is going to be an issue. Coastal adaptation and, and building that is and as a coastal city, that's going to be a, a large question that you're going to be dealing with and the state is probably going to be asking you to deal with, uh, both on a regional and a, and a very local level. And again, I don't think we should be asking you to do those things if we're not willing to put money on the table. So we've been talking about a resilience resource bond, and I'm pushing the administration to help us find pots of money so that you can do planning, monitoring, and the regional coordination that's going to be necessary for us to truly build a resilient California. So as those start to look like mandates, and if they, they come down, they might be, but if they're backed appropriately with money, we should be able to be your allies ultimately in helping you 
build a, a better, a, a resilient Capitola and deal with some of the changes that we know are coming down. So that's a bit of highlights. I'm happy to take your questions. Sure. Um, questions? In? I just have a quick comment. You know, you, 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 and as you finished on uh, the coast and how it's affecting us. And I just wanted to take a minute to say, you know, we, you know that uh, we passed Measure F a while ago to raise money, a tax measure to help us rebuild the wharf. And uh, the cost of uh, everything that's done on the ocean is expensive. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to say thank you to you for oh. the money that you got for us for uh, toward a million dollars towards that wharf is going to come in very handy when we rebuild that. So we genuinely appreciate that effort. Sure. No, that, that is absolutely my pleasure. That is my job. Getting money out of the budget, though, can be a bit dicey. And as the administration is starting to be a little bit worried about the future, the timing for this need was appropriate and was good for last year to, for us to be able to get an, a specific ask like that through the legislature and through the budget process. Those are things that take a little bit of shepherding behind the scenes and just sort of asking folks, don't, don't, don't look under that rock. Let's just let that <laughs> move forward and don't worry about it. It's a, it's a good thing. So those are always a bit of a question, but that much more satisfying when we can get things through. And again, knowing how much you struggle to raise money, do the, meet the infrastructure needs that you have, and especially something that's as iconic to you as the wharf, I was happy just to play a little bit of part in it. You guys, you, you have a hard work to do. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that effort. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I, um, I appreciate you mentioning the, the new approach to recognizing how important um, early education is and really highlighting that that's really important to me um, I currently sit on the children's network which is a requirement you know we're all appointed to different to right. boards and commissions and I think you might have a representative come visit I every do. once in a while yeah. right and there's several um, bills that we're currently looking at and I just wanted to mention them um, to you this evening um, there's AB 24 which is the targeted child tax credit and um, the AB 123, which is the ECE State Preschool Program Access Standard. So those, um, amongst several others, are going to be um, talked about at the Children's Network. And I just wanted to make you aware of that because it's just so important that we continue moving in that direction of supporting our our kiddos from birth on. So. And, and that's the reason we were able to pass a number of years ago, the earned income tax credit, for example. We we're trying to make sure we're putting real money into the pockets right. of underserved communities, communities with families, and be able to take those stressors off. Yeah. And too often, the stressors that families deal with are generational. Mm -hmm. And if we can break those cycles and give them the support they need, especially with the young children, then we have much, much better outcomes within the family and within the community. We know this. This is what the science right. says. But we haven't always been willing to invest, right. and that's what you're starting to see is, is a more of a willingness to really put some money in and support those children and those families. So thank you for the work you do. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any questions, but thank you for being here and for your work for our community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you as well for taking the time and come give us a report. Um, in, in your presentation, you mentioned in housing in terms of the carrot and the stick. And um, it seems that we've seen a lot of the stick in terms of, uh, of state preemptions over local zoning, um, you know, lot sizes, uh, density coverage areas, parking, um, and particularly with ADUs. Are, are there more legislation that you're seeing that may be coming down on us that oh, yes. we should be prepared for? Oh, yes. And Okay. Yeah, because it, it's, it's very popular in the legislature right now and because the need is so great. So the, our focus on housing is very, very important. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's how we do it, not just what we do. And for example, there have been some bills that want to, so with, with ADUs, because that is a better, it's better encapsulated, it's sort of a known bit of development, there have been bills to, to set fees and to do various things that, that do tie your hands at trying to, in, allow ADUs to be accessory dwelling units to be built more readily. There also are bills that have come through and one that got passed that limits your ability to raise fees and, and sets determine it when a, an application is deemed complete. 
So it is removing your ability to do certain levels of review. And if things change, and which things do, especially on the larger projects, you might be under this bill precluded from being able to go back in and, and address the changes that had been coming down. And, and I think that is a bit problematic. Because on the one hand, so the, the planning and building departments now are fee-based. They have to be because you can't support them out of your general fund. They're supposed to pay for themselves. So if the state now comes in, this is my objection to it, if the state now comes in and shuts off your ability to charge those fees to be able to, to ask the questions, do the review, and do the things that you would need to do, especially for the larger, more complex projects, how do you fund that? We're not giving you the money to fund that. So we're saying we're going to ask you to limit fees but we're not going to put money on the table to let you run those organizations to your standard. I think that's a problem, and that's some of the, the push-pull. Getting jurisdictions, and we don't recognize those jurisdictions that are, in fact, meeting their regional housing needs assessment goals, that are doing the right kinds of things with respect to the housing needs in their community. We're treating everyone the same and putting artificial limits on what you can and can't do without backing that up so you're what, do you, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to dip into your own sparse general funds to do some of the work that your constituents might ask you to do with respect to planning review and holding contractors or developers accountable to what they want to do. So the system has worked now, and with the legislature sort of messing with it, if we're going to do that, my view is that we need to be complete and make sure that we are very sensitive to your resource constraints and recognize that and, and honor that. So I, we can't be keep doing the, the sticks without the carrots. And that was what the governor promised, but again, we've been doing more sticks, very yeah. few carrots. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and it, it's encouraging to hear uh, that you identified that for some communities, these mandates are much more impactful, uh, particularly uh, ones like Capitola, who are already you know, uh, built out and particularly, and, and, and not to dismiss the need, everybody agrees the need is great, but if we're doing our fair share, there should be some recognition of that and allow us to try to uh, manage, um, you know, the impacts in our own community. So, and I, I appreciate you uh, recognizing that they are diverse impacts, um, you know, throughout the state, so. And, and we have to be careful. I think we have to be in, in Santa Cruz County rethink our fear of the word density, because that's really where we're going. Mm -hmm. But if you look at some of the legislation that gets proposed, originally some of that legislation would have, with respect to certain areas that have higher transit throughputs, potentially 10-story buildings. That's not Capitola, that's not Scotts Valley, that's not Santa Cruz. So what I tell cities is make sure you have an approved housing element, because the administration is very interested in those, and make sure that you are doing what you can with respect to the housing needs that are here, and yes, it's painful, and yes, it's difficult, but the more all the jurisdictions are working together and trying to do that, that makes it easier for me to push back and help frame the bill. Because there are cities, and especially a number in the Bay Area, that are just refusing to do much of anything. And those are the ones that build the ire of the legislature. San Jose is a good example. San Jose has been doing more building, putting more housing in than a lot of the surrounding cities, and they're getting kind of tired of it because there are adjacent cities who are not doing mm -hmm. their share in a, it's a, that's a different market because that's the, the South Bay Area there, but when one jurisdiction takes that responsibility and others don't, that's where some frustration builds. So we're all better off, and each city is better off really taking a hard look at what your housing needs are and doing your best to address them. Then that gives me the ability to, to push back on some of these bills, ask for exemptions or exceptions, or find a better way to craft language to not unnecessarily penalize cities that are doing and really trying to do the right thing. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mark Stone, I always look forward to your coming here and doing a presentation and explaining to us what's going on behind the scenes and answering our questions. Happy thank you so much. Um, so Newsom has initiated an effort to try to get a senior tr uh, strategy uh, to move forward on legislation and working with the, the um, California in general. Now Brown did not fund a lot of different things in the past, so 
is there an element like Mellow that's in the ledge that may be starting to think about how to fund some of these elements that may be coming up when the strategy is developed? Absolutely. Well, see, and this was the good news when Newsom, in his inaugural address, really focused on the aging populations and put in place. And, and because, and even though the Surgeon General is a pediatrician and focused on that, she knows that her job is to look across the spectrum. And Governor Newsom has put in place some groups, task forces, organizations to really look at the challenges for our seniors across California, which is poverty, housing, food, ability to live in our communities. We don't have enough skilled nursing facility beds. We don't have enough memory care beds. We don't have enough beds to serve our communities across the board. And when the state a number of years ago got rid of, and appropriately, some of the mental health facilities, mm -hmm. that getting rid of the large institutions was something that I think was well-deserved and, and appropriate at that time, but it wasn't backed with making sure that we have the beds in our communities to support those who need that assistance and need those helps. So we got rid of one problem and created another by not backing it. And that's, that's gonna have, on the disability community, that's, that's what we're struggling with, the disability community, but also has a big impact on aging seniors and those seniors who need more help and more support. So the, the, this governor's willingness to take a hard look at what resources we need and don't need is really a breath of fresh air for our seniors in California. Because he's doing that, he will be, I'm hoping, also building in budget components to this. We've often asked for some help and put some budget requests on the table in, in our legislative budget, the assembly budget, for example, and those have often been negotiated away in the final deal. But if the governor's interested in this and really funding it and putting some money on the table to help our most vulnerable populations at who are the youngest and sometimes our oldest as well as developmentally disabled and others, if we can focus on those of our constituents who need the help the most and really fund those with, with appropriate numbers of beds, appropriate levels of services, I think we can build, again, that's about building stronger communities. And this governor seems to be very interested in it. We have to yet to see what he'll be willing to do with respect to the budget, but his rhetoric and his desire, and his, which is a true desire, he wants to help solve this problem. So I'm pretty, actually pretty optimistic. So it's, it's heartful, it's good to hear that he's trying to address these problems from an overall strategy yes. and, and think it out ahead of time, yes. which I, I really think is great. Um, I'd like to move on to one other thing, and that is recycling. As you know, um, major um, companies that have been accepting uh, recycled objects, glass, plastic, have moved out of the market. And um, that's a problem. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, we need to uh, work a little bit more on reducing our use of plastics. An another issue that's come up to me is the, r the rise in petty theft that may be driven by the fact that there aren't recycle uh, centers or redemption centers. And I'm starting to hear a little bit about that. So I think that we need to address, and I would like to know what you think about this, a relook at our fee that we're paying, uh, the agency that is running the program. Uh, right now it's been, you know, trying to teach or you know, put the message out there that we need to recycle. Well, we can't recycle anywhere now. <laughs> so I think this is something that needs to be looked at. Um, is this being addressed? Is this something across your desk? <laughs> uh, I'll say at this point, yes or no. The, the crisis in the recycling and plastics in our environment, all of these are have, have seemed to be a priority of the administration, certainly been a priority of the legislature. When we tried to put certain bills on Governor Brown's desk, he kept forestalling, even though some of the bills were trying to kind of chip away and do what we could with some of the recycling issues. He wanted, the bottle bill is, is a system that was put in place, and that's the bill that has the CRV and that, right. that collects money on bottles. Well, that goes back to the 80s. Right. And the system, even though the state's sitting on a lot of money, they're not spending the money because the system mm -hmm. is, is not self-supportive and is kind of collapsing and, and they don't know what to do. So we've been trying to address that. And Brown wasn't that willing to, to really be, help us solve that issue. I, I think he recognized the problem. Governor Newsom seems to be, and in fact, we just had uh, a, I had my envir annual environmental breakfast this morning and the secretary of, of Cal EPA was there and he is very interested in dealing with some of the plastics. 
we had a bill in the legislature that did not get brought up on the last day of session, which is Senate Bill 54. And that is a bill that is attempting to look at the plastics in our environment and share the responsibility among producers, manufacturers, distributors with respect to packaging, plastic content in products, single use plastics. That stalled. That was a pretty ambitious bill, but one of the components that was going to be very helpful was it was a framework to, f to push Cal Recycle to do exactly this, to fix the recycling system. Mm. So of course, we hit the crisis a couple of years ago when China, which was our destination for all of our dirty plastics, we, as, as we told ourselves we were recycling, we weren't. We were shipping off most of the dirty plastics off to China, who was happy to take them. They realized that they have such an accumulation of dirty plastics in their own country, they weren't gonna take other countries trash. So they stopped accepting and in fact sent some of it back. That's what created the, the crisis because California did not have all of the infrastructure pieces in place to take those materials, deal with them and put them into form back into plastic pellets for example that can be put into products. Mm -hmm. And now you're using post-consumer material into new products and we've tried to set standards to require more of it. But without that, in that infrastructure to be able to collect manage and process those plastics, there's a missing component that we don't have in our ability to recycle. So it is a complex kind of multi-layered issue. We recognize the crisis. I'm very disappointed that we weren't able to take up that Senate bill, even with some of its flaws, but the governor's very interested in that and I'm assuming and hoping that come January, February, we will be, or even now, starting to address the challenges that were in that bill and giving Cal Recycle the authority and the teeth to be able to solve this problem. Yeah, I think this is going to become weighing more on people's minds. It, it, well, it already is. And people are frustrated that they're paying the CRV right. and, and knowing that things are not getting recycled. There are recyclers around the state that are, stop, that are now telling their constituents, their customers, there are certain types of plastics they're no longer willing to take. Recycling rates in California have gone down. Right. And that is, should be a statewide embarrassment, and, and we have to come up with some better solutions. So as I said, we've been attempting to on a, a smaller scale, and then with a couple of bills, there was a Senate bill and an Assembly bill that went through last year that were identical going through the process, that ultimately were the place to capture this. And when Cal Recycle finally did engage and laid out what they needed, to take those steps, that's what where I was hopeful that, that, that this bill will move forward. So look hopefully for solutions early next year if we can get that passed and start to clean up the, the, the crisis that we're in. But we do know it's a crisis. The administration knows it's a crisis. I know this is a worldwide crisis. crisis and across the country, et cetera. It is, it is. But most Western countries were in the same boat, right? right. They were shipping in boats, shipping it off to China and Southeast Asia. Right. And those countries said, eh, enough, we're not gonna take your trash anymore. And they were not necessarily doing anything responsible with that anyway. They, they were incinerating it or they were just dumping it. And that's one of the things that's led to the amount of plastics in our oceans that are coming out of Southeast Asia and some of these other places that were just collecting all this stuff and didn't necessarily know what to do with it. So that's, we have to, and that's why in California, the, the companies who are, who are producing single-use plastic bottle and all this plastic packaging and such so much plastic content and especially in single-use items, they're trying to convince us that it's our responsibility to recycle. Well, they have a responsibility in this too, reducing the amount of plastic that sits there, putting some money on the table because they're making all the profits off of these products. Mm -hmm. They need to be helping us be able to fund the infrastructure to be able to recover, and then they need to be responsible about the percentages of post-consumer product or post-consumer plastics that are in their products. And we as Californians can't look at recycling as the panacea. We have to reduce, we have to reuse, then recycle. And that's how we get out of this. But we all are take, need to take responsibility for that in, in our consumer habits as well. You know, how much are, wh what, what products are we picking that could reduce the use of plastics? I'm, I'm glad there's no single use plastic bottles up there. Good for you, you have all of those. Uh, that's great, but still, I mean, meetings that I go to and at the state level, what do they hand out? They hand out water in little plastic bottles. Well, that's not helping. 
Yeah, it's not only yeah, the generation of plastic and recycling yeah. uh, um, our, our, our dumps are going to be filling even faster and that's a problem around here. I mean, there's, there's so many um, issues. Um, I'd like to ask, are there any other questions maybe from staff or no? Um, right. City Council rarely does this, but Mark Stone rarely comes here. Are there any questions from the audience that you've come here and I'd like to entertain at least one or two questions? Okay, one question, please. Thank you, and, and for the benefit of the, the TV and, and the record, the, the, the question, the statement was about housing, housing for seniors, housing for some of our most vulnerable population, and, and yes, that I think we owe it to our community to, to be able to do a better job and, and take some of the hard steps and some tough political decisions sometimes to make sure that we are taking care of those who need us the most. I look forward to your action. Thank you. Well, we're working on it. We're working on it. All right, thank you. Before you leave, ah. um, you immensely helped Capitola in helping to fund our redo of the wharf. Um, as many of us know, we think of the wharf in many different ways, and you know it's iconic. It's part of Capitola. Many things are, but that's one of the first things you see when you come here. Um, I've gone all the way around the Bay Area and go to fishing places, you know, off of various wharfs, and I say, where do you like to go to fish? And invariably, Capitola comes up. People come from all over. I mean, it's just one of the places. And so you've, um, because of your contribution and working for that contribution, has helped us tremendously so that we could save that wharf. And I'd like to present something to you, and I'm sorry I can't hold this at the same time. <laughs> it's the <a> problem. <laughs> This is a wonderful oh, painting, excuse me, a picture, a photograph, right. And um, again, it also talks about a part of Capitola. We had a hotel a long time ago, which burned down. And we may get another hotel, it won't quite look like this, but we want to present this to you. Oh, I, I <laughs> a little embarrassed, thank you. No, because you should not be. be. Because this is I, I'm just doing my job trying to help you. You and, are doing and your job. Sure the state does things, but th this is actually really cool. So <laughs> it really is cool. I love some of these old photographs of yeah. Santa Cruz County, the different cities, Capitola, as, as our area took shape. Mm -hmm. And this is absolutely beautiful and amazing. And you know, even having the ship sort of stopping by Very your unusual. wharf and, yeah. and I, you know, the, the picture that sits behind you as yeah. we all get to, to see that as you do your business is just, this is very Capitola, so thank you. Shall oh, we it's get a, a, a shall great we honor to give this to you and you're right, job? we are doing our job, everyone up here is doing their job, but sometimes something special happens. <laughs> thank you. Would like to get a picture of thank you. Time. Okay, sure, sure. And just for the record, it was two million you got us, not one. So I just oh, want to yeah, get that on the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. All right. So now, truth be told, my staff will probably fight over this, whether it goes <laughs> in district office or capital office. <laughs> I might take it to the capital because I always Thanks. love to show my colleagues and anybody who comes in the capital office what the district is really all about and make them envious. So okay. yeah, we'll <laughs> figure right. that out. But come, yeah. look for it. I like that one. We'll in, look in for our it. our office, yeah. either in the capital or in the district. We'll look for it. But Thank you. Thank Definitely. you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. So with that, we have a presentation about our local government academy. It's going to be introduced by staff, I presume. Jamie? Okay, great. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm pleased to announce that we are going to be kicking off our 2020 Local Government Academy session here. Um, the Local Government Academy is a series of evening workshops that's intended to help local, local residents learn a little bit more about Capitola. We've been doing them since around 2003, I believe, and generally every two years, usually around the election cycle. And the program is really intended to give residents and participants a better understanding of how the city works, how we work with other local governments, and really promote civic participa uh, participation. Um, really, the goal is finding folks that want to become members of our larger community and help out with the city. Uh, we have a tentative draft schedule at this point. This draft schedule has been honed over the years by feedback from participants at the different sessions. We start out with the big picture. And we go under the hood, a little bit more of the administrative side of the city, then we hit the streets with public works and the police department and wrap it up with, we call it the team effort, when we bring in folks from our other partner agencies like Central Fire and the library district and folks like that who also provide services in our community. And then it culminates with a recognition at the city council. Our plan is, is that this would be taking place through January and February of 2020. Um, what we always hope to achieve out of this is get more folks who are interested in coming to our public meetings, volunteering for the city, whether it's our VIPS program or helping out at the museum or even helping out at other allied, allied nonprofits or other agencies. Um, maybe have some folks who are willing to volunteer to serve on a board or a commission and sometimes we get folks who run for public office after serving on going through the academy. So if you're interested, anyone who's interested, um, you can check out information on our website. We'll be accepting applications through December 13th. Uh, you can always call at City Hall or email Lori, uh, Larry, and his email address is up there. Could you go back to the first slide, please? Sure. Um, excuse where you list the um, different sessions, sorry. Oh. These are tentative. Um, this is using the format that we used last time, so I think we probably will tweak it based on availability, but this is sort of the, the general framework with, that we like to operate within. Are there any, I have some comments, but are there comments from other board members? I just think it's fabulous. I really enjoyed participating in it. I think it was put together really well. The amount of time really worked for me. You know, um, I think a lot of people who attended had work and other things going on, so I really thought it um, it was just really well put together. So I'm excited to present it to some of my networks and hopefully get the information out. If you can please email the information to us, we will so we'll we include in the Friday update for sure. Okay, wonderful. Or even just like a flyer of some sort that I can push out to our network. Okay, thank you. Was one Sam? No. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I echo. Yvette's comments. Um, I'd like to change it up a little bit, and the reason why is I, I spent a lot of time talking to people in the city here about why don't you run, you know, and why don't you get involved, and you know, this is a lot of time. This is I don't know what to do, you know, a um, whole many different assortment of things. But one thing that keeps coming up and this is what I'd like to consider having included in this, is what does it really mean to be on city council? Or what does it really mean to take a leadership role if you're gonna be on FAC or city planning? This is something that isn't often within everyone's experience. You have many different things that we do in our life, but to actually stand in front of the public and take a leadership role give it yourself to the community to express ideas that you think might have some traction in the city that you love, that you take on a role of listening to people, your constituents, that you take on a role of trying to become an advocate for things that you hear the members of the public feel are important, that you take on a role to try to balance the issues of how to run a city from a staff's perspective, all the legal framework, the fact that we live in a community. Some of these things aren't normally within the realm of experience of an individual person who's actually perhaps 
wanting to be involved. So I'd like to uh, put out there that I think we should have a session, incorporate something in our community, um, what do we want to call it? Academy, excuse me, that actually tries to address that. So you're right, I would like people who come to this academy to volunteer, to perhaps run, to seek appointment on various committees. I think this is what makes our community of Capitola strong. I really do. But I wanna help them make that decision because they could see better how to do it. And so I think we have some time to try to figure out how to do that. I know there's people out there that actually give courses and try to help people um, learn how to be leaders in their community. I think this is something we could ferret out and reach out to the community in general. I think it's important to give people not only a chance to see how we function in terms of all the bricks and pieces, the, 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 the framework of our city, but how do you operate within that framework? So those are my comments, and if there's any response from other city council members, I'd appreciate it. Um, I've mentioned this to Jamie already, and Maybe staff could think about this. If I get support from the city council here, I think this would be something worthy to bring back to us and give us a sense of how you would like to do it. Um, I think it's a worthy goal because I think it will help make our job better in terms of responding to the community and being also an effort that makes maybe a wider breadth or a wider selection of members of our community feel, hey, I could do this. I'm going to comment on that for you, if you don't mind. No, I'm asking for comments. Oh, well, the city manager want to talk, and I'm just going to cut him off there. I, I'm a little confused because what I look at this is I don't necessarily look at this as a training ground for how to be a city council person, how to be in a committee. I think what the intent of this academy is is to open up to citizens that have an interest about, you know, what the underside of the city looks like just as a resident. It's not, I don't, uh, I think we're looking at apples and oranges here. What, what I'm getting from you is, more of a, you know, how to train to be a, uh, on a committee or how to train to be you know, a, a future city council person or politician. And I think the intent of this academy, the city manager can correct me if I'm wrong, was just to allow people from the city to come and, and see how their city that they live in works and those components that, that, that it takes to run a city. And with that, I'll turn it over to the city manager. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really in support of modifying this. I think that we're talking about two different topics. So. The intent behind this program is really to sort of pique people's, in, pique people's interest in Capitola, uh, understanding what we do and how we do it as a city. Um, it's really, you know, at the end of the day, in four nights, you're not going to learn how to be a city council member, right? That takes, that takes years of practice and training. And, and so I think really the intent is, is to get people excited about learning about opportunities to serve. You know, that's one of the things we definitely touch on is about what are the boards and commissions, what are the opportunities to serve, how do we do things as a city, uh, and how they can become involved. Now, one, one mechanism maybe to address um, something the mayor brought up would be, we, we have, I think we have done this in the past, is invite the mayor at the time to come give kind of an overview and kind of a kickoff to the front end and talk a little bit about experiences as a, as a city council member. And I think that that could be a, a valuable addition to this, um, this itinerary. Well, put me right on the spot, <laughs> which I don't mind doing, but, um, okay, uh, any other comments? Well, if Sam. I maybe wanted to contribute uh, on the leadership aspects. Um, there is a group countywide called Leadership Santa Cruz, at least I believe there used to be, and I believe it's, it's still, still in existence, and, um, and I'm sure the staff as a part of this process could help tap people into that, which would give them the, the bigger scope um, and um, training uh, about um, you know, developing those leadership skills throughout the county. But I view this, I mean, as um, Jamie mentioned, is these are kind of the nuts and bolts, the fundamentals of how um, Capitola works, local civic government works. Um, and I think that this would be a good starting place um, and then depending on, uh, I think, the turnout and what 
the graduates at that point may be prepared for and maybe want to move into, then we can maybe look, do we assist them go into leadership Santa Cruz or refer them in other ways or maybe develop um, you know, phase two later on. But maybe then Jamie could come back to us if there are really interested individuals and, and a sufficient um, numbers of them to warrant it. So that's my contribution. Okay, um, I'll be glad to participate. Um, se several cities around here do s something of what I'm saying. Uh, Los Gatos is probably one of, one of the best examples I could think of. So um, let's move on. Are there additional materials? None. Okay, at this time I'd like to say that Ben Johnson is running our um, communication version from uh, Cablecast live on Charter Communications and it could also be seen on Cable TV Channel 8. And it's also being brought, uh, re uh, recorded for rebroadcast. So we also have it on our website. Any additions and deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, so this is a time for public comments. Anyone who would like to speak on any item that's not on the agenda, please come forward and you could give your name and it'll be recorded for the minutes. Uh, you have three minutes and the clerk is recording, uh, excuse me, setting the timer. Thank you for coming. So mine isn't quite so cheery. Um, That's okay. This is a public meeting. My name is Brenda Barnett. I'm a 30 year Capitola resident. I love Capitola, but now I'm not, I'm gonna have to leave it. I'm here with four of my neighbors representing five units of a 10 unit building in Capitola that includes 29 residents and 10 children. Um, we've read a lot about Capitola's commitment to homelessness and affordable housing, and so that's why we're here. I've lived in this apartment for 24 years. The others have lived there between three and 12. On July 19th, the building was sold. On August 1st, we received increases taped to our door between 29% and 70%, I was the lucky 70%, which was an increase of $845. On September 27th, myself and the other tenant that's on Section 8 received a 90-day eviction notice, and the reason that was selected was because we were on Section 8. On October 8th, Newsom, God bless him, um, signed AB 1482 that will stop these abuses. October 16th, the rest of the residents received eviction notices and, which, and everybody has to leave. And they said the reason for that is that they're gonna do massive renovations. The building's now up for sale. It's not rocket science to figure out that they did this before um, January 1st. I know that there's two apartments in Santa Cruz and one in Watsonville with the same thing. The entire building has been let go. Um, Los Angeles County did an ordinance 186340 and this protects their citizens from this very abuse that's happening now I and mean, we saw that it was going to happen like AB 1482 of course this was going to happen so our question to you guys is what ordinance has Capitola done to protect us for citizens do you have one coming and if not why not And our last question is, how will this council help us? I have a copy of this. You guys can have the ordinance if you haven't read it or seen it. Yeah. Um, I won't answer the question, but after you leave, I, we do have some programs to help in terms of rent support and moving support. And I don't know all the extent of what we have in that regard. Is, that's something we're prepared to talk about right now. Well, it's not on the agenda for this evening, but yeah. certainly we, we, they should get in touch with our community development director who, who can help point them in the direction of city services and partners that we have in the nonprofit. Okay. But you can't invent housing. No. That we can afford. Right. So that's the issue. And I'm soon to become homeless as well as all Thank of these you, other Lydia. families. 
Right. How can you help us with that? And I'm talking about legislatively. For goodness sake, Los Angeles did a thing. And we knew this was coming. This wasn't going to be I, a surprise. Okay. So you made your comment. We're, we're not prepared right now to deal with it. And we hear what you have to say. So the recommendation is to come to our community development director and we'll see what can be done right now for you. And I think this, because you brought it to us, is gonna help us try to figure out how we could respond to something in the future so that we could pre pre be prepared for the situation you're in. At this point, I'm not sure of all the things that we have available to help you in your situation, but we do have programs to do that. Thank you very much for your comment, Brenda. May, may, may I? Yes, comment Sam. there. Um, I just wanted to, one, um, I think that's horrendous what's happened to you. Um, I wanted to encourage, uh, if you haven't already gotten legal counsel, to seek legal counsel, go to CRILA. Okay, um, so I mean, that, that's good that you've done that. Um, and I really appreciate, you know, bringing your plight to our attention. Right. But unfortunately, even if we were to pass an ordinance, we could not apply it retroactively to, uh, s s you know, fix your situation. Uh, but right, it would only be looking forward. Um, um, and I think that you have alerted us uh, the, to these kind of situations and, and state actions that uh, cause uh, local impacts. Um, so I just wanted to um, say that, you know, we hear uh, what you're going through, and I certainly feel for you, um, and I hope and that we can do what we can to provide you, connect you with resources that are uh, available in terms of rental assistance um, and housing assistance um, and any other uh, local services through our network of community programs. Um, so um, I didn't want you to just walk away feeling that we're ignoring or abandoning you, you know, keep in touch um, and, um, and work with, you know, your, um, with your attorney to um, see what they can do for you, okay? So, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming down. If I may also, uh, Mayor. Yes. Um, and also, if, if you can find my contact information on the city's website, and I don't know if the situations are similar or the same, but I know that there is an organization working with people in Watsonville that are going through this same thing. Same it's the same, oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I don't know if, if we can put you, I don't know if I would be able to put you in touch with the organization that's helping those tenants. I don't know if they would be able to help, but if so, if you could email me your contact information, I will try to make that connection. Oh, you did? Okay, well, I will check that out. Interesting, okay, I will check that. Did that go to me personally or the whole city council? Mm -hmm. Me personally, okay, I will yeah, go back through it. Person, Interesting, huh, okay, I will go back through my email and check that again. Thank you for reaching out. Just for the council's information, I'm assuming that what the speaker was referring to was the city of Los Angeles enacting an urgency ordinance to essentially bridge the gap between the passage of uh, the state legislation and the uh, effective date of the, of the state legislation to avoid evictions from landlords who knew that they would not be able to evict uh, under the new state legislation. So where does that leave us in terms of potential action on our part? Well, council member story is correct that certainly anything that you do now would Retro not be retroactive, yeah. but I, any council can consider an urgency ordinance similar to the city of Los Angeles. Is there a, is there a way to find out if there's any other uh, apartments or anything else in our area that might be affected? And if so, could we have an item come back to us regarding that? So, you know, are, was this particular apartment complex the only one that was affected? And if not, could we bring something forward my guess is that the, that apartment complex is not unique and so that there right. certainly would be other residents who would be potentially subject to the same situation. So we can bring forward an urgency ordinance. I, you know, whether or not that can, that can happen by the 14th of uh, November, that would be the first date that we could do that. Right, so we would need it on the agenda again 
before then so that the council could discuss it. I mean, this is sort of a, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not, this is a, this is a non-agendized item yes. for, this count, for this council meeting. So my suggestion if the council bring were interested back. would be to bring it back to agendize a discussion of an urgency ordinance. And then we could, if, if the council wanted an urgency ordinance, we could pull it together quickly. So we could ask for that to be done on the next agenda. Well, just outside the box, can we can we have a special meeting for that if we deem so? No. Y you could have a special meeting to discuss it. You could not pass an ordinance at a special meeting. Right. Okay. So, what's the best way to proceed here if we want to take action? Which I think we do. Agenda. If you would like, we can put it on the November fourteenth discussion uh, as a discussion item, as uh, the city attorney suggests. It will be. We're going to be talking about the mall. Uh, that evening, so it's going to be a late night. It'll come up later in the evening, but it's probably appropriate. We can bring it back on the 14th. So that's not in time for the 14th deadline, right? I'm, I'm getting a little confused. We can here. put it on the 14th. Agenda. We can put it. We can okay. put it on the next meeting. Okay. So let's do um, concurrence of everyone on the board here. Yeah. I think okay. That's yeah. Let's do. please do that. Thank you very much, Sam. And I just, I know they left, but I would want to publicly thank the folks that were here presenting today um, because this definitely enacted some action tonight, so. Oh yeah, I definitely thank them. It was hard for them to come. So um, in a sense, that's city council comments or let's go to city council comments. I have one. I have okay. none. I have none. Okay, Yvette? Well, in the spirit of what you were talking about earlier, Mayor, um, about leadership and opportunities for people interested in running or getting more involved. There is a 2020 campaign hacks workshop taking place oh. on October 26th at 9.30 in the community room at the Santa Cruz Police Department. Um, it's hosted by the Breaking the Glass Ballot Initiative um, and a couple of local pioneer women here from the city of Capitola. So if anyone's interested, I invite all of you to attend nothing from me okay. Sam? oh yes if i may I, I did want to report from back from the last arts commission meeting on october the 8th uh, and there had been a request from the city council to the arts commission whether they would uh, take on uh, the responsibility of reviewing and approving uh, the bia banners that were proposed to go up and i know jamie had sent a, a report to us in his uh, regular Friday updates, but I did want to announce publicly that the Arts Commission has agreed to accept that role and that responsibility. So whenever the BIA is prepared to move forward, um, the uh, Arts Commission will be reviewing the banners. Great. Um, I did go to break-in class last time. Oh, good. And uh, I was probably one of the only guys there, <laughs> but um, I found that, um, a great discussion and um, totally, totally support that effort. So um, any comments from staff? Not at this time. Okay. So moving on, we have the consent agenda. So at this point, is anyone on the city council wanting to pull an item or anyone in the public that would like to pull an item? I'd like to pull item F. Okay, so do you want to do it at the end of the meeting or have it discussed right now? Um, well, I was um, a quick comment suggesting that, uh, well, it's more than a quick comment, but I was maybe uh, going to request that we maybe handle it first under general government business in case okay. there's someone in, in the audience that's here for that item. Okay, so. Can I, can I just confirm real quick? Yeah. That, do, that item is just to schedule the appeal hearing, correct? Not to actually discuss the correct okay okay so can we schedule that quickly so we could do eight a and just move everything down how's that you're gonna do that first yeah we'll do that okay. first all right okay so F is moved to 8a and everything else is moved down so we get an 8d and an 8e okay. so is there a motion on motion to adopt consent oh, calendar okay any discussion from those in the audience on the consent no. Okay. Bring it back. Is there a motion? Motion to adopt. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's go move on to general government and we will have 8A, which is the former F under 7. We need to schedule an appeal of the Planning Commission denial of a tree 
removal permit. So. Yeah, and yeah, I asked to have that pulled and because I wanted to discuss uh, the scheduling uh, not until January of 2020. Um, my reading of the staff report, this is uh, a health and safety matter um, and, and especially with the winter coming, um, I think it's more appropriate for us to consider it sooner. Of course, I know that now that's just been compounded by what we just added to the November meeting, um, but um, the November 14th meeting, but uh, I would maybe like to request uh, and uh, that the, maybe the first meeting after, or after the November 14th meeting that we bring this and consider it instead of waiting until the end of January. So that's why I brought it up. Okay, uh, Katie, do you have any comments on this, please? I do. Um, I wasn't in the direct conversations when the scheduling was taking place, but it was my understanding that the appellant was not available to meet prior to a January hearing. So um, that is um, my understanding. Um, we can. There was po the possibility of I understand of December, but that is. There are other problems with December. Um, but, but they, my understanding is they also they were out of town for November, so that was the applicant was not available. So they're not we available did, in November. It, it did okay. take, we received the original application, um, the original appeal in early summer, and it did take us until October to get them to hearing, because I, I do believe they're very busy and um, couldn't meet our schedule. So this was one of the earliest dates, but we could check in with them and maybe continue this item. Oh, yes. Katie, was this in conjunction with them and giving, going back and forth with them? And I just want to make sure. It, it is. We were trying to set the date with them. First, we landed on the first meeting in January and then decided to push it back. So I think the, the earliest, my understanding, meeting that they could attend would be um, the second Thursday of January. I would uh, concur with the uh, Councilman Story and try to like to have this meeting in December. So if you could pass that, uh, I, I mean, I would just like to make that recommendation. And, and normally I would just, okay, they asked for it later, but what I'm hearing, this is not just about their property and their home, it's about limbs falling on sidewalks and pedestrians that may be walking by. And so that gives me a greater sense of urgency um, and instead of just you know waiting until um, through the winter season before we hear this. And so I'd say if we could schedule this to be heard in December, um, that would make me feel more comfortable. And if they want, and if the applicant wants to submit a written um, statement prior to that, um, or send a representative, um, I think that, that that's the way it should be handled. There's an additional challenge around the December meeting at this point. Unfortunately, I don't believe that we're going to, I think we're going to be talking about moving the December date. So at this point, we don't have a December date that we can offer to the applicants. Um, we're going to have an item on the next meeting's agenda to talk about rescheduling that December meeting. So we can certainly continue this and have a further conversation with the applicant about what dates might work for them. Um, but I do suspect, I know that our staff was sensitive to the needs, their needs and our needs, and this was the date that they landed on as the most appropriate. But we can certainly continue this if council would like to see if there's a possibility of getting it in December. Well, Sam, I'll okay. move that we continue it for further discussions with the applicant and with staff working to um, find a date that's uh, sooner. I'll second that. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion from the audience? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So it passes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, and council members. Sure, thanks for that um, item. I did read the letter from the, uh, the neighbor, or the, the peti pe petition in, <laughs> and I was very moved by some of the things you said. So on to um, consideration of after school program scholarships. Uh, staff report, please. Mr. Mayor, council members, good evening. The item that I have for you this evening is um, to consider a after school rec club scholarship program. So we started um, the 
Capitola Recreations After School Rec Club at New Brighton Middle School uh, for a fee of $12 per day for residents, uh, which is, residents includes the city as well as the Soquel Union Elementary School District, um, or $14 per day for non-residents. Um, Recreation has responded to public inquiry about scholarship opportunity available, which there is none at this time. Um, looking at similar scholarship programs in the county, they reference the federal income eligibility guidelines as a measure for who would receive those benefits. Um, the California Department of Education, using the same um, income eligibility guidelines, also awards free lunch to any persons who are already receiving CalFresh and CalWORKs benefits. Um, so using this information, um, this is a suggested application form, and I'm gonna dial in, get a little closer here for you, but um, so, Using this application process, families would be able to register or would be able to request scholarship for the remaining of the school year. So this would include four of the, the four remaining sessions for the school year. Um, we would not be requiring proof of income and um, participants would be required to pay a registration fee that would not exceed $25. So. After submitting basic contact information, the number of sessions that they would like to apply for for benefits, they would be referencing the um, income eligibility guidelines, reporting the, their household size and their household monthly income, or indicating that they are already receiving CalFresh CalWORKs benefits. And at the bottom of the application, would come to a point where they would sign indicating that they, um, that indeed their income is at or less than the, what the scale um, shows or that they receive the CalFresh CalWORKs benefits. Um, this application would need to be submitted five working days before the start of registration and any applicant that receives benefits would receive it through their California Recreation Active Net account. So they would receive it as credit that would be then spent in their registration process. And um, any funds that were left remaining at the beginning of a session would be returned to the fund and reallocated to additional applicants. Um, so staff would be uh, managing this process and awarding benefits. The applications would be coming on a first come first serve. We would be reviewing them on a first come first, come, first serve basis. And um, with the recommended amount, this would address at least 15% of the participants for each session. Um, as enrollment varies day by day, it could go to um, a larger number of individuals, um, or, but at least 15%. And this scholarship fund would very specifically be addressing the after school rec club. It would not be um, for other programs that are offered by recreation. Hmm. So the recommendation before you tonight is to approve the scholarship program for the recreation division and to authorize a budget amendment that would allocate $4,000 from the dedicated early childhood and youth programs fund and accept a 4,000 matching contribution to the scholarship program from the Soquel Union Elementary School District. And I am available for questions at this time. Um, who do you work with at the elementary school district? So Cal Elementary School District. I'm sorry. Who did you work with? Who is our partner in this regard? For the the matching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the school board. The school board, mm -hmm. and so you brought the. That's right. You came to the school board last week, I think. I did go to the school board last week to present them as an update. We were not discussing the scholarship match at that time, um, but we were definitely discussing the success of the program so far. Okay. Great. 
So, um, you know, I helped run a, uh, um, a program for soccer, and one of the most embarrassing things was people not being able to participate because they couldn't pay the fees. So I totally support this. And is there any discussion from those in the audience? Bringing back to the board, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And if I can just add one comment. Nikki, sure. can you come back to us um, whether it's being utilized or not mm -hmm. in the future? I don't know what the timeline or by the end of the school year. I'm sure you'll do a report out but if it's actually being utilized for this particular population because um, I'm worried that there might be a gap of folks not being able mm -hmm. to apply for the scholarship and we're missing some of those kiddos. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, so there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So passes. Moving on to item 8C. Introduce an ordinance amending chapter 1504 of the Capitol Municipal Code pertaining to building and fire model codes. Hi, as our building official um, gets herself set up, I did want to let you know that staff identified um, a small error in the ordinance that was included in your packet. It has a section one which reads chapter 15.4 is amended to be titled building and fire codes. And that is a holdover from the last time. It's already titled building and fire codes. So for the second reading, we will remove section one and renumber sections two through four to reflect that change. Um, our city attorney did say that it, this falls into a very, you know, a minor um, category, so it's, you know, didn't require uh, republishing or any discussion in that manner, but we did want to let you know um, that we will be making a slight change when you see it the next time. Okay, thank you, city clerk. Okay. Uh, good, may good evening, mayor and city council. Um, every three years, the building code uh, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, energy, green building, and fire code, and other associated codes and standards are updated to include the most current construction and engineering principles and practices. Under the purview of the California Building Standards Commission, the newly revised California Building Standards codes are published for required local adoption. The process is to ensure that the latest construction, engineering, and life safety techniques become standard practice throughout the state. The last code update was in 2016, and the mandatory effective date of the 2019 California Building Standards Code is January 1st, 2020. Amendments to the city's building regulations of the uh, of Title 15 of the Municipal Code are proposed to recognize the adoption of state building standards codes. The city is permitted to adopt amendments to these building standards. The significant amendment to the building codes includes deletion of concrete construction standards which had been carried over from previous code adoptions. These construction standards are replaced by current code language. We are also adopting the 2019 California Fire Code as amended and adopted by the Central Fire Protection District. The significant changes to the 2019 State Building Standard Codes include in the California Building Code, Part 2, uh, new changes to the Building Standard Codes are to revise and clarify structural provisions in the California Building Code. Uh, as an example, um, CBC section 1510.7.2.1 provides additional information regarding seismic and wind design requirements for rooftop solar panels and references new sections added to ASC E7. This amendment also allows DSA, the Department of the State Architect, to accept industry standards to ensure compliance of solar panel attachments after recent solar panel attachment failures. The other, another change in the California Building Code is accessibility provisions in Chapter 11B were updated to align with federal ADA standards and incorporate, incorporate fair housing accessibility guidelines and state assembly bills. The California Mechanical Code was changed uh, for um, minimum filter efficiencies to align with the Energy Code and the California Energy Code um, has Im 
updated to include domestic hot water solar preheat becoming a prescriptive measure increased third parties testing will be required for insulation in installation that's a nice tongue twister and uh, HVAC systems may require increased duct sizing which will affect construction to allow increased space for larger ducts Uh, the non-residential and commercial construction requirements in the energy code which includes new multifamily residential structures um, will have new requirements for interior windows and doors that lead to unconditioned space and co2 monitors will be uh, prescriptive to help control, control outside airflow hmm. part 11 uh, is the california green building standards code which will now require EV or electric vehicle charging infrastructure for new parking areas and additions to existing parking. It also requires shade trees to provide 50% of new surface parking areas and additions to surface parking areas within 15 years and shade to 20% of landscape areas and hardscape areas within 15 years. The recommendation is that the City Council adopt the 2019 California Building Standards Code, Title 24, and amend Title 1504 of the Capitola Municipal and Go Zoning Code. Uh, Central Fire Protection District Fire Marshal Mike DeMars is available to answer any, answer any fire code questions, and I'm available to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, Sam. Yeah, thank you for that um, report. I had a question about the ordinance itself and on the agenda packet, page 86, the new section 3. There was just, um, the language there was kind of perplexing to me, um, referring to seismic design categories, uh, D sub 0, D sub 1, D sub 2, method GB, is not permitted and the use of method PCP is limited to one-story single-family dwellings and uh, accessory structures I was just wondering if somebody could interpret that for me and then following below it it refers to add the E footnote notation in the title of table R602.10 Zero. I don't know if you see where I'm reading. I but do. I do. Yeah. I, I. You know what? I wasn't able to interpret that um, and know what it means. And it seems like, at least in our ordinances, they maybe should be, you know, like self-explanatory. Um, this. Um, the. I can explain this to you. The seismic design categories D0, D1, and D2 apply to our seismic zone area. It used to be required, uh, I mean, uh, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It used to be called Zone 4, seismic category. I think you might be familiar with that. Uh, they have changed this in the residential code. We are in seismic zone category D2 in this area. What that means is there are certain provisions in the code that require wall bracing in structures and there the method GB is the use of gypsum board and PCP is Portland cement plaster this is um, the nomenclature that's used in the building code and those two methods they have found are not effective in this area but because the California building code has been adopted from the international building code this was part of the international building code and locally um, it, these are not effective methods of bracing buildings to uh, to survive seismic events so um, so well the professionals who are going to pay attention to this are going to know what this means absolutely okay yeah uh, and even the reference to the footnote e yes notation um, it's part of the table in the residential code that addresses braced walls for seismic construction Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions. I left my notes at home. I took a different set of notes. <laughs> so um, there's an issue there in trying to provide egress. Um, so another way to get in and out of a 
building, and I was wondering what that was about. I was thinking of ADUs, but you know, like an internal ADU. But I was wondering what that was about. Oh, in the in the code adoption. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, let me take a look. I'm, I'm glad you're able to flip through this <laughs> in moments notice. Sorry that I didn't prepare you, and I should have. That's all right. Um, when it when in addition. Um, very often additions to single family dwellings do not require a second exit. Um, so it, it's a clarification of an existing code section. It doesn't change the code section. Okay, so now we have to have it, okay. Yeah. Um, another one in, that was in uh, section e 11, I think, and it was um, mentioned here in your presentation uh, connected with the EV uh, charging stations. And so now we have to, um, provide more tree coverage that was also in that section? Yes, that's part of the green building code for new construction of new parking lots and additions to parking lots. Uh, tree shading uh, has a great deal to do with uh, providing shade keeps temperatures down. Right. And of course, with global warming, they're finding that shading these areas uh, provides a lot of temperature reduction. How's that different than our current code? Because we do put a lot of trees like in, out in the mall, for instance, that kind of thing. I honestly cannot tell you how it compares with the zoning code because that's where our tree uh, requirements would come in. Right. This is mandated by the California Green Building Code, so it might be something that the zoning code needs to take into consideration. If We're going to have to increased. update. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I do have a question for the uh, individual from the fire department. Mr. DeMars. No, that's okay. Come on up. Come on up. So while you're working, uh, coming here, um, so I was very interested to find out that, and this is probably unfortunately necessary, uh, you have the power to, um, I guess, use force to get something done sometimes, and you have to do that in conjunction uh, with the police department or the sheriff's? Yeah, if necessary. Um, Can you explain that? I absolutely. We, we have the authority to enact uh, police powers to enforce the code. Code is law. So uh, we do have the, f the power to act as law enforcement officers to, en to enforce the code if, for some reason, someone does not follow the code. However, many of us are not sworn peace officers so what we would do is we would rely on local law enforcement agency to assist us whether it be capitol pd or sheriff's department depending on what part of the district we're in at the time okay my sense is that people comply with the fire department's request i've never had to use police powers in my 30 something years yeah this is a big surprise to me so okay i scare them i guess I yeah, yeah i guess so <laughs> That was my main question, and um, yeah, I, I sort of blurred out when I started looking at the fire requirements. So yeah. I'm sorry about that, oh, but I did okay. pick up on that one. And I apologize, I was answering another question. No, no, uh, he has a lot of questions, I have to admit. So I like talking with someone, I get some answers, it's always fun. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, any questions from the audience? Seeing none, bring it back to City Council for motion, Ed? I just want to make a quick comment before we have a motion. I just said, uh, first, uh, Mike, before you leave, I, I, you've probably been here doing your job long enough. Remember, City of Capitola always resisted adopting the fire code. And uh, I'm glad that we're way past those years and we're down to just updating and modifying. And, and with that, I uh, make a motion for staff recommendation. With the changes read in. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> I know you are. Thank you for that. You, you were patient. Uh, go, go ahead. So your motion would be uh, to adopt the staff recommendation with the changes read into the record by the city clerk? Absolutely. Thank you for that clarification. Second. Second with the uh, adoptions. Okay, good. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I'm sorry, who was the second? I missed the second. Kristen. Okay. Uh, so now we're on to introduce an ordinance amending Capital Municipal Code Chapter 2.12 Planning Commission. And this item is a follow-up from our September 26th meeting. Get it up on my end. Um, as you will recall uh, from that discussion, at one point there was um, some language in the Municipal Code addressing 
uh, residency requirement for either the Planning Commission or all boards and, and committees. However, that was removed in 2000, and at last month's meeting, the council directed staff to come back with an ordinance adding specific language for the Planning Commission only, um, asking that or requiring that all applicants be either residents of the city or the sphere of influence as defined by the local area formation commission. Here is the map of what that actually means. The green areas are the city limits um, and the red is the sphere of influence. So as you can see, the, the main extension is on toward the Pleasure Point area. So as um, recommended previously by council, um, anyone within the red area would be able to apply um, to serve on the Planning Commission. And the way that takes shape within the code, uh, we placed it, we didn't add another section, we just um, amended section 212.010, uh, deleting that it was only referencing number and added um, the sentence describing the residency requirements as indicated in the red language. So that is the entire um, change that we are uh, bringing forth today. So the recommended action is to approve this first reading of the ordinance. Any comments? Any questions, I'm sorry. No questions. Okay, any questions from the audience, members of the audience? Okay, I see nodding. Bring it back to City Council for discussion. I so move to approve the first reading of the ordinance amending section 2.12 regarding planning commission membership to require that commissioners reside within the city limits or the sphere of influence. Second. Okay. Um, I have some comments uh, because I'd like to readdress this ordinance and maybe ask for a friendly amendment. So I read some of the comments from members of the public and I agree that this is a great compromise. Um, the thing that bothers me though is I don't want to end up with a situation where everyone's in the sphere of influence but not in the city of Capitola. Um, there's some other comments that LAFCO may expand or contract, you know, I'm not too worried about that. But I am a little concerned if we get too many members who are not in the city of Capitol who live in the sphere of influence. And to me, that's going to weigh it in a direction that I'm not too happy about. So I'd like to have a friendly amendment that we limit that to one person outside the city of Capitol within the city of, uh, within the city's sphere of influence. I hear crickets. I didn't make the motion. I made the motion. So I'd like a second if we could get that. Well, the the maker of the motion would need to accept it as a friendly yeah, amendment. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. I don't want to be in a situation where a majority or even the whole planning commission is outside the city of Capitola and they're yes, they're within the sphere of influence. So I want to limit that to one, or maybe two, but one is what I'm starting with at this point. At our last meeting, we talked about bringing back um, the removal of planning commissioners as well, because I think that's really important to think about, because the emails that we all received were pertaining to whether or not the planning commissioner was going to be making the right decisions for our, that was that was the real issue was they were concerned that our appointments were not going to be making the best decisions on behalf of the city or for the city and so i think with that it's really important to put into place a mechanism to remove somebody that all of us as council um, with the majority vote to put something in place in that sense because these are our appointments this isn't you know one person or another I think what for me 
the removal of someone that isn't necessarily doing the job is more important than questioning our individual appointments. Um, I, have, I hear what you're saying. Um, if you have any response to that, if you don't feel that's adequate enough to put something in place like that. Well, you've been the person on the city council that I've talked to about this in terms of the Brown Act, and I totally agree with um, your prerogative or any one of our members here to appoint whom they feel is, is the best person. Um, and I've supported you on that. And I support the idea of uh, extending to the sphere of influence, and that was your motion last time. And I still support you on that, and I promise to give that support to you. Um, if we ever get to a situation where we're considering removing someone from city council, excuse me, from city planning, that's usually after a sequence of events that have reached such a stage that, you know, we just can't take it anymore. And so we, we decide that we need to take some action. Um, I'm a little confused. Are we talking about a different topic? Because I'm, I'm not. I'm answering I'm, Yvette's. I, I understand, but I'm, I, I guess I, I probably should have said something then because I'm, the question that we're talking about is the ordinance about the ex extension of one person, and now we're right. talking about something else completely different. And I don't know if, are we within boundaries talking about that? Is that a, allowable under this? Or? I, I think you are. At this point, my understanding is the discussion is about. Uh, the mayor's request for a friendly amendment to Councilmember Brooks' motion. And so Councilmember Brooks asked for more information about another portion of the appointment and removal procedure that will be coming back to the council, which I assume would meet Councilmember Brooks' um, concern and perhaps give her information about whether or not to accept the friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. that, that was your yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm. I'm trying to ask. Um, Thank you for that explanation. Right. Because I come. I understand what our what what you're you're trying to do, Mayor, and I, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate you trying to find some balance. With my original motion, I believed I was finding good balance in listening and, um, to our community and, and also finding a middle ground. Um, I don't want to add any more confusion or nuances or restrictions to something that I feel should just be straightforward. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to accept your, your, amend, your friendly amendment. Okay, with that, um, there's a motion and a second. Um, let's have a roll call vote, please. Council Member Story. To be consistent with our discussion last time, um, uh, I'm gonna vote no. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Council Member Brooks? Aye. Council Member Bottorf? Aye. And Mayor Bertrand? No. Okay, so let's move on to an ordinance accepting, oh, excuse me, um, approve the sole source contract with CSG consultants for on call building division and contract services. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, before you tonight is a request for con a contract with CSG consultants. The reason for this is within our building division, we're trying to maintain the high level of service we've always provided to um, our customers that come in for their building plans to be re reviewed and approved, as well as keeping our services in the mornings of building inspections and counter hours open in the afternoon. Um, and also to provide our staff members with the training they need when, they, when we hire new hires and make sure that they're able, we're able to give them the time they need in order to get trained into the position and maintain, again, our level of services. So in 2018, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of where we've been. We changed the setup of our division. Previously, there was a building official and a building inspector. We changed the model to have 2.5 employees, one being the building official at half time shared with Scotts Valley. The second was a full-time building inspector and third, a development service tech, which also um, administers our affordable housing program. So with that new um, setup, we, we unfortunately, we had everything planned perfectly and then one of our building inspectors decided to take a new opportunity, which um, threw a wrench in our, in our plans. So with that, in, in, we lost our building inspector in June of 2019, 
in July of 2019, we reached out to CSG consultants for a contract of $25,000 to keep our services um, up to par. Um, so CSG came in, they helped us with building plan check, they provided us with building inspectors, and also counter help. One of the advantages of CSG is that Scotts Valley also uses CSG, so our building official, um, Robin Woodman, was able to um, you know, know her employees, know who she's working with in this contract position, and it was, it was uh, an easy fit for this while we were doing our recruitment process. As of right now, we have uh, $1,300 left remaining in the fund, and with our new hire, we actually, we need to um, invest in our new hire. Um, I think it's going to be a two-year process to bring us back up to speed to where we were previously and being able to do all of our plan checks in-house. So with that, um, I've put together a two-year goal. The first year will be uh, considerable training for Cat Thrasher, our new building inspector, and continuing to rely on CSG consultants for our plan review while Robin uh, provides training to CAT. Um, I've also planned in there 60 hours of a building inspector to come in-house while CAT is, there's different building inspector training sessions that she can go to and because we have a part-time building official, it, it's not reasonable to have your building official to fill those shoes during her 20 hours that she is at Capitola during the week. We also have utilized consultants um, for engineering review when it's a more technical project in your commercial areas. Um, and so I've built in a $5,000 buffer for, the, for that. So um, currently, um, and then for the fiscal year 2021, I plan to decrease the amount of plans by 50% that would be sent out to CSG. So hopefully at that point, building inspector thrashers uh, has more training, uh, less plans are going out, and then hopefully when 21-22 fiscal year comes up, I won't be asking for the continuation of the contract and we'll be doing these things in-house. So um, I do anticipate 60 hours, again, for having a building inspector for those times that our building inspector is out of office and also the ongoing need for engineering consultant. This modification uh, requires a modification to our approved budget. I had budgeted $8,000 for the year for outside consultant fees, and that was really for those engineering needs that we run into every year of needing an outside consultant to review. With the $25,000 um, that has already been contracted with CSG, um, that leaves, in the $8,000 that was budgeted, that leaves a deficit of $17,000 from that previous contract, and then with the additional services I'm asking for through the end of this fiscal year of $61,300, that brings the total budget amendment up to $78,300. Mm. Um, I do anticipate additional revenues this year. I would like to mention that with the mall plan in and the amount of contracts that we are managing right now and the um, additional fee that we, the 21% fee to cover administrative costs of um, the mall project. I, I do think that we're not gonna cut, um, cut even on this, but there'll be probably a 50% coverage of these additional costs that I'm, into, that I'm requesting this evening. So with that, staff is recommending that the city council approve the sole source contract for CSG consultants for on-call building division contract services. Thank you. Any questions? Sam. Uh, on the matter of the sole source contract, I noticed it justified because they have um, acquired extensive background over the last two months. Um, when they were originally hired, did they go through a formal RFP process? They did not. At that time, we were in a position that we, we had to get somebody in fast in order to keep up on our level of service. So we did not go through the formal RFP process for that contract amount. So that was kind of an urgency matter. It was. Um, and um, also, oh, I was a little on the budgeting. Um, there's a now uh, 41,700 uh, in the negative. Um, and you mentioned that um, some of that would be recovered through the uh, mall redevelopment. 
Is that is that not already um, in our budget for 1920? It is not. We were not in um, not having gotten the application before the budget year began, and knowing the extent of the contracts and what would be before us, that was not budgeted. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Probably for the city manager, where's this additional revenue going to be coming from? Well, at this point, as the community development director alluded to, we do have some additional revenue coming in as because the mall project is now in, but at this point, we're looking at fund balance for the remainder. I do have a question. Um, any other questions? No. Um, so you mentioned 65% of the actual charge is what the contractor would receive from, for their payment. Um, since we have to charge for what we actually expend in terms of our staff time and stuff like that, I was just trying to understand that. So 35% is a little bit higher, I think, than what we normally take for staff time. Isn't that correct? So we follow a standard practice in the building field of um, when a permit comes in, it's, it's based on valuation and square footage. And then for the valuation, the typical fee of an outside consultant is at 65% of that fee. So of our square footage fee, um, CSG, Leaf, the other building uh, consultant groups we've used in the past, it's a standard formula Okay. for consultants. And that ends up paying for our staff time, basically. The 35% pays for our staff administration. Okay. Mr. Mayor, one point that I think is worth uh, worth considering in response to Council Member Story's question about the RFP, the city attorney and I were just discussing, if, if the mall project moves forward under the schedule we believe it will, they could be looking at building permits potentially in 2021 or 2022. That's going to be such a large project that I think at that stage it's going to make a lot of sense for us to consider a specific RFP for those services because I can easily imagine a situation where we're talking about a you know million dollar plus contract and I'm going to want to make sure that we have somebody on board who is really focused on just getting that done for us. So, you know, I don't know that it helps this decision necessarily, but in that context, there's clearly I think an RFP for these services coming up. Right. That well, I that makes certainly a, a lot of sense, especially of that scope. Um, and I'd hate to, I mean, see a sole source be built from stage to stage uh, and kind of get grandfathered in. Um, so I, I think that that would be good. And maybe you could bring that back to us when that happens. I had one more question. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of the training. I just want to get a better idea of how we go about training. Thank you. As far as training goes, um, there are several organizations, the International Code Council and California building officials that have ongoing training throughout the year. In December, we will be sending Kat to some, uh, several, um, I think there are two plan check classes that she'll be taking. They're day-long classes. They, they will get her started. I have a long background in, um, long-term background in plan checking. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, when I am in the office, I do take, we are going through plans and she's getting started with the concept of plan check. It's not something she's experienced before, um, but we, will, we have continuing education that comes up um, and there is online training as well that you can go through. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience? Back to City Council for motion. Motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. Sam? Second. Yeah, Sam I'll seconds. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so moved. Okay, on to consider adding streets within the Jewel Box neighborhood to be slurry sealed. Mayor, yes. Council Member Story, did I hear you want to add that as a future agenda item, or is that going to come back as an RFP? I just don't know if we need a. No. Well, I, I didn't ask for it because I wasn't sure when that was going, but okay. I mean, I, I did ask if the city manager would be sure to bring that back to okay, us when that came up, and uh, hopefully it will be in the record. and. Yeah, it'll, yeah. It'll right. keep good notes. And it's, so. it, it, we wouldn't be at that stage at this point in the project. It may be a year out, but like the other RFPs and contracts we've brought forward to the council, this would be another one. 
Yeah, I, I did actually cover that point with uh, Katie because uh, I had some questions about this and she talked to me about that as an eventuality also. They've already planned on doing this. So, Steve. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Item before you is to add additional streets to the county slurry seal pro or county uh, sewer project where they will be performing a slurry seal on a majority of the portion of uh, the jewel box neighborhood. This item was originally scheduled for our last council meeting, which got canceled because of the power outage. So um, as we're all aware, the county has been going through the jewel box and replacing sewer lines, um, including Wharf Road, 47th, 48th Avenue, uh, and through the jewel box, down Wharf Road, and uh, including Cliff Drive. Uh, the installation of the sewer pipe is now complete, uh, manholes have been built, concrete's put in place, and the final stage of this project is to slurry seal all the roads that they trenched in. In 2018, when the city did a slurry seal, we did a citywide slurry seal project, we became aware of this project and actually removed 45th, 49th Avenue from the R project so that that slurry seal wouldn't just be destroyed even though they weren't trenching on 49th. Um, it just the, the traffic increased construction traffic on there. So we pulled that out um, with the intent of adding it uh, as an additional work into this project. Um, and when we came to identifying the streets, we realized that if we added 47th Avenue, 45th Avenue, and Topaz in a few small sections of Emerald and Jade there, we would essentially complete a slurry seal on this entire neighborhood, which I think is a, is a key element to try and do. So w we um, requested the contractor give us a, a price. Uh, they held their pricing for the majority of the additional seal slurry work that they gave to the county and um, added, asked them to give us a price for adding the green streets here. So the price for that is $84,750. Now originally, a lot of this work was intended, we had hoped to pay for out of the 2018 slurry seal budget. Unfortunately, those prices came in higher than we anticipated. So there's only $21,000 in change remaining in the slurry seal project. So we're also recommending that we take additional funding from the 38th Avenue rehabilitation project that was completed in 2018, which has 72,000 and change left in it. So our recommendation tonight is to authorize the Public Works Department to reimburse the County of Santa Cruz up to $84,750 for the additional streets to be slurry sealed as part of the jewel box sewer project and authorize a budget amendment in the amount of $93,750 which takes the two um, fund balances in the 2018 slurry project and the 38th Avenue project and puts them into a new project. Um, we will not spend all that money, but it puts it all, the remaining balance in one project that will be then available for a future budget transfer when we need money in another project. So before uh, we uh, close this, a full disclosure here. 45th Avenue and Topaz are on the project list that you're approving tonight. Um, due to multiple communication problems with the contractor that's doing the sewer work and the county, uh, that work was completed today. Um, sorry to tell you that, but it's good that it was done. Um, I, on Tuesday, was left with a position of um, either taking this these two streets off of the project list and not completing them or telling them to complete them today. I made the decision to uh, proceed and um, gave them authorization to proceed today. So here's the full schedule. Um, all the work, and it's kind of hard to read, but all the work will be done by a week from tomorrow and that'll be the end of that sewer project. Um, there'll be some striping, but the major inconveniences will, will have end. So that is uh, my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sam, and then Chris. Well, I'll comment and then a question. One, you made a very good decision. Thank um, you. <laughs> and uh, the second one, you know, when the um, sanitation district was putting in their pipes and um, we got comments from residents about the detours, um, are we able to maybe control that better with this project that's going on? Can
there's uh, this will be fast. can't sugarcoot that there's not going to be there's going to be major go. inconveniences during this um there will be traffic uh, especially when they do wharf road coming down the hill traffic's going to be put on 47th avenue there's just not another good detour route no. uh -huh. fortunately it's the end of the project so okay we hopefully won't have to do that again okay and hopefully it'll go quickly yeah this i mean yeah for slurry sailing end of october and november we're getting wonderful weather for slurry sailing so uh -huh. <laughs> yes yes thank you I had a similar question. Um, I understanding that there's a um, this will be done pretty quick in the, in the next seven days. Um, that there's probably not time for any kind of full public notice. But is it already on our website, or can it be put on our website, or emails go out to any anyone who's you know contacted us before about the detours, just to let them know that this is going to continue and it'll be done in a week. So the county has done quite a bit of public outreach on their own on this so I'd be happy to put the schedule and talk about that on our website too but um, a lot of the communication has gone between the county and the residents there and I've relied on them since it is pr prim primarily their project sure okay thank you Ed? yeah I, I just want to echo Sam's comment that uh, this was a great decision to make especially in light of the fact that our last meeting we were supposed to deal with this and uh, we would have I'm sure passed that so to not take that opportunity. I have one question though. Uh, we took some of the money from 38th and I happen to notice that they're just tearing up 38th Avenue. What's what's going on over there? That's the county um, has discovered they had another failing line in 38th Avenue. So um, you know, it's one of those things where we try and get all the utilities done before we pave and- I, I know you did that, that's why, and I, and I thought we had had that so that it was not gonna be dug into, but anyway, I just saw that today. So thank you for that. Unfortunate. So what happens if we don't reimburse the county? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can we just say Thank you. no? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I went out to look at 49th, um, and you know I was looking at the redwood tree too, but I was looking at 49th, and someone came running down the street, and I stopped him. I said, <laughs> "You're not supposed to be on here right now. It's supposed to be curing, right?" Well, apparently there wasn't some ballards or signs or something like that way down near um, I guess uh, East Cliff there somewhere in that direction so I don't know what we do on that maybe they came out of the mobile home park or something like that I, I don't know why they came down but anyway there's a screech mark <laughs> All right, well, we'll have the story company take care of that yeah, there is a up. screech mark yeah okay near the uh, redwood tree that we've been talking about okay any questions from the audience Okay, bring it back here for a motion. Motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. So it passed. Thank you, Council. End of the meeting. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Mayor, before we adjourn, okay, first off, not I, just wanted, yet. I just want to note that I think this is the fastest public works project delivery <laughs> ever. <laughs> so I want to commend Steve on that. Yeah. Um, maybe faster than would be wise, but nevertheless, very fast. Uh, second, I just want to let everybody know that I got a PG&E text during the meeting alerting us that we may be experiencing a public safety power shutoff starting on Saturday. So just pass that on to your constituents. We'll be putting information on the web, but uh, probably I would expect that the same areas that were affected with the last shutoff would likely be the ones to be affected again, although I can't, um, I can't guarantee that. Can, so can we make I, a form? I'm sorry, Mayor. Yeah, and I'd just like to make one statement. Uh, Steve, thank you for working with Sanitation and coordinating this project. Um, I think, you know, what we're getting out of this because of that coordination and your effort is much better toolbox and obviously extending to the uh, toolbox area. Thank you very much. Can we just make sure that gets walked to the residents at the Senior Center across from uh, the, at Knob Hill? I know that our police officers knocked on doors and since we have a bigger, t a longer timeline, if we can make sure that happens again. Yes, we will use the same protocol we did last time. Okay, okay with that, meeting adjourned. Thank you.